Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our very first Zoom session tonight. So hopefully everything will go as planned and we won't have any unexpected glitches. Um, so my name is Danielle Lange. I'm Executive Director for uh, Connections Resource Centre. And um, I'm accompanied here by two of our staff, um, Nat, who's doing the tech part tonight and who's our communications coordinator, and Kate uh, Foy, who's um, up in the Pontiac. So um, just a few words on connections and what we do for those uh, who don't know us is, um, you know, we serve the English speaking community in the Udawe region, and we provide information and referral on all types of different services that you might be looking for, um, for all age groups. Uh, we also offer activities for all age groups, and this year, given the situation, our activities are uh, going to be virtual. Uh, we also have a website with tons of info, um, a very active Facebook page, and I invite you to check out our Facebook page with all our upcoming activities um, for kids, and we're going to have some starting for seniors next week. We also have a newsletter. And um, you can become a member of Connections, and um, it's just a, a great way to get information on what we do and, um, you know, current information, um, as well as supporting us in terms of, um, you know, continuing to, uh, to be present in the community. And Nat is going to be putting up the, uh, the website, the link to the website, where you can uh, get information on becoming a member. Um, so just a couple of words in terms of, I guess, our, um, our Zoom etiquette is uh, if people could please um, stay muted during the presentation and, um, and use chat for any questions or comments um, that you may have. At the end of the session, we're going to have an evaluation. So you'll receive um, a survey monkey by email. And we'd really uh, appreciate if you could just take a couple of minutes. It's really short two or three minutes um, just to let us know what you thought of the session. And so um, this is basically the first of a two-part series. So um, tonight we'll be going over, I guess, all the, all the theory around this and then um, coming back in two weeks to do uh, a question and answer. So I'm really pleased tonight to welcome Joanne Doucette, who's a registered social worker for the Child, Adolescent and Family Centre of Ottawa. And Joanne has done already uh, a couple of our, um, of our sessions that have all been extremely um, popular and very, very uh, informative. So without any further ado, um, I, I'll let Joanne take over and um, Thank you. bring us this presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much, Danielle. And thanks uh, to Nat, who did so much also to help organize this, and to Kate as well for all their hard work on their side. Um, I'm super excited to be presenting through Connections again. I always really enjoyed being in person um, with Connections and the Western Quebec School Board in the past. And this is a new experience being on Zoom, but I guess we're all having a lot of new experiences this year. So, you know, we're making the best of all that technology has to offer. And I think I'm hoping too that this might also have been maybe more accessible for some of you that are joining tonight. So welcome to everybody. Thanks so much for being here. So I chose emotion coaching um, when the Connections group reached out to talk about doing a workshop. I felt like emotion coaching of all the sort of things I'm doing in my practice with kids and teens and their parents right now during the pandemic. This is probably um, the therapeutic technique that seems to be the most helpful for the biggest group of people. And so I'm really hoping that it'll resonate with many of you tonight and that it will be something that you can take away and right away put into practice uh, within your family. I want to start by acknowledging that the ideas around emotion coaching have been used and kind of created by a number of people in the field. But I've done training specifically with Adele LaFrance, who is the co-developer of um, emotion-focused family therapy, and a big part of EFFT is emotion coaching. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that they have so many brilliant ideas and resources on their website, and the link is right there. 
and I'd encourage any of you to check it out after. There's videos of the um, developers sharing more information about emotion coaching that are free for anyone to access or with a small donation. So they have great resources on their website. And again, just like an acknowledgement of all the amazing work that they do. First of all, I want to talk about what this workshop is not. So this workshop is not a parenting talk that's about me being some kind of expert telling you the right way to parent. It's not what it's about at all. It's also not a specific formula that will for sure work for every single child or teenager dealing with every kind of problem. I can't promise that but it does seem to help in many, many situations with many um, kids and teens that are presenting with a wide range of struggles. Um, and so what we are really working towards tonight and what I really hope this workshop will be is first of all, this is a compassionate, non-judgmental space for parents. My premise is that all of us parents are doing our very best with the resources we have. Everyone loves their kids and would do anything for them. And so we're all doing our very, very best. It's really about learning a specific therapeutic technique, which is different from just a parenting approach. So we have certain instincts as parents and things that we turn to that often work really well and work with many kids. But when we have kids that are really struggling with intense emotions. When we have families that are dealing with the crisis of the pandemic, um, and especially when I think of many of the youth I work with who have depression or anxiety or other mental health struggles, even pre-pandemic, that have now been magnified, we often need something more. And so that's what we're going to work on tonight is this therapeutic technique called emotion coaching. This is also about lowering parenting stress and increasing your empowerment as parents. So even though initially it might feel like, wow, this emotion coaching sounds like a lot of effort and a lot of work. Actually, the idea is that I just want you to try doing things differently. And my hope is that after it starts to become a more natural response, once you've practiced and you feel more comfortable using it, that actually it's going to mean it will require less energy and less time to get to the end goal that you have of supporting your kids, of helping them through some difficult situations. So that's the hope. And above all, it's really about strengthening the relationship between you and your child or teenager, because the parent-child relationship is, you know, the most important thing. And we're going to talk about just how powerful you, you are in terms of what you can do with your relationship with your child. Oh, just want to make sure I didn't skip a slide there. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, Danielle already mentioned a little bit about the Zoom etiquette. Just a couple of things to keep in mind. The chat is... Uh, we really welcome you to put any comments or questions in the chat. Um, the connections group is going to put that all together for me at the end. And as was mentioned, we're going to have on October 13th, the follow up question and answer, which is when I'm really going to be able, I'll have time before then to really come up with some information to share in response to your questions. If we have some time tonight at the end, we might be able to touch on a few questions, but definitely in a couple of weeks when we have our, our um, session, we'll be able to touch on those uh, questions. Keep in mind that within the format of these talks, we can't necessarily address um, your specific child. So we can address, you know, topics like how do we use emotion coaching with ang for anxiety or how do we apply this for teenagers versus younger kids. But, you know, within the context of these talks, it's, we can't help everybody with the specific situation of their child. And let me just minimize something so I can see. Oh, yes. And so the focus will be on learning emotion coaching across a variety of situations. All right. A little bit, I'm just going to take about 10 minutes to kind of do a little bit of what's behind this. And then I promise we'll get right into what the therapeutic technique is. But this is really important for us to talk about. So in terms of why we're talking about using therapeutic techniques with, with kids, with youth, 
Prior to the pandemic, there was already a lot of concerns. And I know most of you are here tonight because you probably have some concerns about how your children are coping. And even before the pandemic, there was a lot of worries about the increasing rates of mental health for this generation of young people. So depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and suicide have all been on the rise over the past 10 years or so. There's been a very big shift in our society and this has already been a big concern. And so there's a lot of questions now about how is the pandemic going to affect the psychological well-being of young people? How are they taking this in and perceiving what's happening? And how are they going to cope with all the, all the sort of factors connected to the pandemic? How school has changed or um, having to self-isolate? So I know all families are really worried about this. So I want to look at what is within our control because there are so many things right now that are outside of our control but what do we have within our control as parents as professionals that are working with kids some of you coming into this talk tonight may be teachers or mental health um, workers you know what do we have within our control that we can do to really build resilience so that's what we're really looking at tonight First of all, I want to mention that, of course, there's a lot of factors that influence mental health. So there's rarely sort of just, you know, one explanation for why young people are struggling with anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. And, you know, a few that we have kind of will mention here because they are important. Um, life stressors. So some of you may have kids that have undergone significant changes or stresses. It could be separation, divorce. It could be a death in the family. It could be a change of cities. And of course, now all kids are dealing with change. As a society, there is collective loss and change that we all have to contend with because of COVID. Temperament is a significant factor too, and many of you as parents might identify with how right from, you know, infancy, you could see that your child had a very sensitive side, that maybe it was harder to soothe them when they were upset. That's a factor that can make it hard for people to cope with emotions or regulate their emotions. Genetics play a role as well. So there is often a hereditary component. So for example, when anxiety is at play with a child, um, often parents are able to identify that one or both parents might struggle with anxiety. Societal factors, as we've already mentioned, there's been a big shift in our society. So many changes even before COVID um, in terms of the impact of technology and social media on young people. This is I think undeniably a factor when it comes to mental health and again another factor that often feels outside of our control as parents and as families. Um, family environment of course plays a role so how families talk about their feelings the dynamics in relationships can be a factor Emotion processing skills so some kids are better at regulating their emotions some can lag behind their peer group and there's a lot of other factors. I want to go over those just to really stress how there are so many different factors that contribute. And I think a lot of parents whose kids are struggling sometimes feel, maybe even sometimes when they're seeking supports and services, might have a feeling of, am I to blame or is someone seeing, you know, our, me as the parent as the issue? So I just want to say from the outset, that is never the explanation. It's never the sole explanation. Kids that struggle with emotion regulation, with anxiety, with depression, come from every walk of life, from every type of family situation, from every socioeconomic demographic. That is never you know, the only explanation, really, for the most part in my experience. So I think that's just important that we all acknowledge that because sometimes there can be um, a little bit of a sense of, of shame or worry about that. And that's just not part of the philosophy of emotion coaching. So, and it also, I wanna mention that to explain why are we looking at parents or caregivers and what they can do differently? So it's not because you've been doing anything wrong. It's because emotion coaching is an advanced caregiver skill. So it's actually 
above and beyond what we usually need to do as parents. And it really is to contend with these situations where kids are struggling. That said, emotion coaching works really well as for just the everyday ups and downs of family life and kids having sort of fluctuations in their emotions, which is really a normal part of childhood development. It works well for that too, but it's especially needed often for kids that are really struggling. I hope that makes sense to everybody. And it is also something that is within our control that today we can actually start doing some things differently in a therapeutic way to really support kids. And the other aspect of this is that caregivers have a right to support. When I say caregivers, I'm referring to you as parents, but I'm also acknowledging that we may have grandparents here tonight. We might have foster parents. So I'm speaking to anyone who's in a caregiving role. And caregivers often feel very left out of their kids getting support for mental health issues, but you deserve to be involved too, and you deserve to have support. The parent-child interaction can be incredibly healing. So there's all sorts of research to show, and neuroscience has shown how a secure and comforting parent-child dynamic can really regulate emotions. It can actually change the way that the brain is working for people when they're having difficulties with their mood, when they're in distress. So it's incredibly powerful. <clears throat> and so as even though there's a lot of factors involved in the onset and the maintenance of emotional struggles, this emotional style of interaction between you and your child is something that we can work on that can absolutely make a difference. I'm gonna play this little video. It's only a couple of minutes long. Some of you may have already seen this. This is Brene Brown speaking. And for anyone that's ever um, read any of Brene's books or maybe listened to her podcast, she's just an amazing resource when it comes to relationships and topics such as empathy. And the first step of emotion coaching is to validate your child. And often we think we're being validating, but with emotion coaching, we're actually going to learn how to do validation in a very thorough and kind of extra, uh, like giving it an extra emphasis. So this video sort of sets it up nicely. So I'm going to play it now. And maybe, um, Nat, you can give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Oh, just a minute. I got to go back here. There we go. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put this a little lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. 
But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay, great. So we're going to touch more on this. Um, we're going to come back to some of the ideas that you just saw in that video as we work on how to really validate kids. So I'm actually going to start with a little, um, I have two case examples and I tried to choose case examples that hopefully a number of you um, would kind of relate to. And these are maybe, these are situations that I see again and again among the kids that come in to see me in my practice um, and who I work with. So the first one we'll name Lucy and she's pre-teenage. So let's say she's around 11 or 12 and has a really sensitive temperament. So actually, um, Nat's going to put a link in the chat section about a link to a handout about super feelers on the Mental Health Foundation's website. And I love the term super feelers because I think it's such a compassionate term. And the truth is that so many of the kids that really struggle with emotion regulation feel all their emotions so intensely. They often are also physically sensitive. They might have sensory issues and they just feel all their emotions so much. I relate to the super feelers because I think I was pretty much a super feeler as a kid and one of my kids is a super feeler too. So it's uh, something that really resonates with me. All right, so we have Lucy and Lucy has a lot of intense emotions and a lot of outbursts. She can be very irritable and explosive with her family. So a typical scenario is Susie, Lucy comes home from playing with her friend and she storms into the house, runs upstairs and is just crying and so upset. And so her parent very innocently and in an effort to be supportive calls out and says, Lucy, what's going on? And Lucy screams at the top of her lungs and says, Ella is so mean and nobody likes me. Everybody thinks I'm a loser. And Lucy is completely distressed and, and overwhelmed, runs to her room and slams the door. So I'm gonna ask you all now to just take a moment to think, but not overthink. What would your typical parenting response be? What's the thing that is our go-to when A, your child is distressed and you can tell how upset they are, and then also related, maybe when your child is really angry and kind of throwing all their anger at you, what would be, and I'd invite any of you just to add into the chat what your response would be. Now, Nat, I might need your help here because with the slides, I actually can't view the chat. So I might get you to, once we have a few answers in the chat, maybe you could just read them out for me if that's okay. So wonderful having a co-host. So we'll see if anybody has, and again, just sort of what, com what comes to your mind. There's really no right or wrong answers, but guaranteed if you're thinking it, there's probably a number of people that are also thinking it. Oh, we have a few responses coming in. So I'll read mine first. Nobody thinks you're a loser is what I would say. Uh, Kate said, that sounds really difficult. I know she's your best friend. What happened to make you think that? We have another one from Laura who says, that's not true. Pat says, give her some space. Samia says, Ella is probably feeling upset about herself and is taking it out on you. Uh, Britt is saying, you seem really upset. I'm sorry that happened. And Emnu said, I would ask what happened first. Someone else said, oh, that's not true. Lots of people like you. And Amy said, talk to me more about it. Okay, I love it. Amazing response. Thanks so much, everybody. So I just jotted down a few of them. So your responses kind of covered a range of, you know, instincts. So what I'm going to touch on, I jotted down ones that sort of fall into the typical parenting response that we have, which is, so for example, to say, that's not true. You know, everybody loves you. You have lots of friends. Or maybe to sort of think, okay, how do we fix this? Okay, I'm going to give you some space. 
um, to try and come up with like some way to understand it, right? Like Ella must be having a really hard time to treat you that way or to ask more questions to try and explore more. And then some of you also gave responses where you're really trying to convey that empathy. That must be so difficult. That must have been so hard. So anyways, amazing, wonderful input. I'm going to now give the second case example, and then we're going to kind of come back to those responses. So here's another one. I forgot to name this person, but let's, let's call him John. And John's a 15 year old teenager. So John has anxiety and has struggled with anxiety for a while. So even pre pandemic, John had a lot of issues with getting to school. And as we know, this is also another big struggle for lots of kids before the pandemic, we know no kids went to school for a while, but even before the pandemic, school refusal has been a really big struggle for many children with anxiety. So John has been back to school this September since school started up again, but is now starting to miss days of school. So it's morning, um, John really struggled with sleep last night and mom goes to wake him up and John says, I can't do it. My stomach hurts. I feel really sick to my stomach and I didn't sleep. I'm not going. So again, what might be in this situation, you're faced with your teenager who has anxiety and who really struggles and who now doesn't want to go to school. But as the parent, I know so many parents in this situation feel so anxious and worried themselves because they know how important it is for their child to get back into that school routine and stick with it. What might be some of your instinctual kind of reactions in this scenario? Any input? I'll just give everyone a minute or two to actually type their responses in. All right, so we have a few responses and I'll just start reading them. Uh, Kate said, what stresses you out so much about going to school? What makes you afraid? Worst case scenario. Sherry said, I know you feel anxious, but you have to go to school. I said, well, maybe he could just stay home. <laughs> Pat said, take away the internet. Laura <laughs> said, I don't like going to work either, but I have to go. Samia said, my parents would tell me to get up and go to school. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, great responses, which again, cover a lot of what I would imagine parents would say. So things, I love the take away the internet because of course, so many of us as parents just worry so much about the impact of screen time and yeah, absolutely. That could be a factor with school refusal. And so try to think about how on earth do we motivate this, this teenager to get to school. Um, I heard some validation in there, like that must be hard, but also, you know, statements like you have to go, right? Trying to set the expectation and give your child a push towards what is really an important behavioral shift for them to go to school. So yeah, great answers. So let's talk, those are all those instinctual responses. And what I really want to clarify is that with the vast majority of kids, so if you have um, a teenager, for example, who doesn't struggle with anxiety and who's not wanting to get out of bed, all those things would probably work really well. But that's not the situation with this teenager. He's got anxiety and has already gone through a year or so of missing school. And for any of you who have a child with that level of anxiety, I know that you know it's different from the average just not wanting to get out of bed in the morning, right? And so the typical parenting responses don't tend to work very well to increase motivation, right? And likewise, when we think about Lucy, who is so emotionally dysregulated, she needs something different. So the typical parenting responses tend to fall in these categories. We move to problem solving or fix it mode. I mean, I'm a parent too, by the way, I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old. And I mean, I just think my kids should recognize that I'm so wise and I have so much life experience. So I think as parents, we all just really wish that our parent, our kids would really respect that we know what is best for them because we are really wise. We have a lot to tell them, right? Um, so 
I mean, I'm joking a little bit when I say that, but I think we do really wish that kids would let us help them find solutions because we have a lot of good advice to give. But funny enough, they do not always want to hear our solutions or have us solve their problems for them. We sometimes do try and silver line it. And so I heard some good examples of that when we were talking about Lucy and people said things like, um, you know, that that's not true or, you know, maybe minimizing a little bit, even if that's not our intention. We sometimes use distraction and avoidance. So for example, you know, with Lucy, it might be sometimes as parents, we feel overwhelmed and we kind of bury our head in the sand and we don't want to go there. So we might say, you know, do you want to watch TV with me or should I get you your favorite snack and just try and distract from the situation. And we do a lot of comfort and reassurance. You know, um, Ella was just having a bad day. You just need to give her some space. Everything's going to be okay. And there's a number of other things we might do. Again, those are not necessarily bad. It's just that when kids are really distressed, struggling with their mental health, not regulating their emotions, they sometimes need a more therapeutic response. I think it's important to understand where those instincts come from, right? So there's something called the writing reflex. And for me, it was so helpful to really understand this. Even as a therapist, I feel this all the time. When people are struggling and have problems, I. I feel such empathy and I want to fix it for them. But there's this strange thing that happens, which is when people are really distressed, really overwhelmed, or not ready to go into problem solving mode, it often has the opposite effect when you try and give advice and you try and push them in the direction of, you know, you being able to solve their problem. So we have something that's called the writing reflex. And it's this instinct to fix what is wrong for others and it is especially present for parents with children because we just love them so much and we want to make things better for them. So it comes from a place of love and it's, it's a really kind of caring response. But does it work or is it working? So if you've been trying this with your child and you notice it either makes them more upset or angry or they're withdrawing fruit from you and disconnecting and shutting you out, then it's good to really consider that it's time for an alternative approach. But just remember that term. This comes from the motivational interviewing literature. And it's this that writing reflex. We have to kind of catch ourselves and even like visualize a stop sign going up when you go into fix it mode and remind yourself, I can't go there yet. We are going to get there eventually, but not yet. So the emotion coaching is a three step process. I want you to remember it takes a bit of time and you got to practice. And right now we're going to do an overview of the three steps and we can fine tune um, as we go on. And when we have our question and answer in a couple of weeks, we can keep working on it together. So the first step is validation, which we've already talked a bit about. Let's look at how validation really needs to be when we're doing true emotion coaching. First of all, as a parent, you have to be calm. So this, I do not want you to try emotion coaching for the first time at 10 o'clock at night when you have nothing left in your tank and your child is really grumpy and you are overwhelmed. Definitely not the time to try it for the first time, okay? You need to actually be reasonably calm and grounded. We want to spread our calm to kids. We don't want to actually have them join our chaos, right? I've heard that expression and I really love it. So if you need to take some space first and do some deep breaths. So maybe when Lucy slams her door and goes into the bedroom, if that's your child, maybe you need to first take some deep breaths yourself, turn to your partner or someone for support and to kind of gather your energy and go in calm. Think about affect, body language, tone of voice. So it's striking that balance of making sure that your child knows you're in control, that you're not dysregulated yourself, because that doesn't help matters. But you don't necessarily want to be completely neutral. So we don't want to be robotic in our interactions. You want to actually convey in your face, in your body language, a lot of empathy and caring. And sometimes to really reflect the empathy, you need to mirror a little bit of the emotion. So with a child like Lucy, for me, I would definitely lean in. If it's a child that's comfortable with maybe a touch on the arm, 
I would do that. And I might even furrow my brow a little bit and kind of scrunch up my face as I'm talking to show her that I'm feeling a little bit of her distress, if that makes sense. And then your words, which is probably the most important part. We want your, the words to really convey the child's experience. So remember in the Brene Brown video when she said, you know, it's about perspective taking. And this is actually really hard. I mean, think about when kids are throwing their big emotions our way and we're feeling overwhelmed. A lot of times it can be frustrating, it can be annoying, it can be really overwhelming and anxiety provoking. And that can get in the way of us digging deep and thinking, like, what is really going on for Lucy right now? What might she be feeling? And that's actually what we need to do. We really need to look at what is going on for her. So here's an example of what it would look like. So first of all, I'm going to just mention now, and um, Nat will put in the chat, and it will also be sent out in the follow-up email to all of you, that there's something called the Emotion Coaching Cheat Sheet that's on the Mental Health Foundation's website. So it's a handout posted on their website, but she's going to put a link in the chat for you. And this is great, the cheat sheet, because it gives you all sorts of sentence starters and ideas about how you get going. So usually when you start your, your validation statement, you say something like, I could understand why you feel this way, or I'm thinking that you must feel, or it would make sense that you're upset. If I put myself in your shoes, I think, those kinds of sentence starters. So in this case, I'm choosing, no wonder you feel. And we want to get to the feeling. So, I mean, when kids are really angry, there's often a more vulnerable feeling underneath. And with Lucy, it's pretty obvious she's, her feelings have been hurt, right? Under that anger, there's a lot of hurt. So I'm going to make some educated guesses as Lucy's parent about why she might be upset. So you know how sometimes when we maybe, and again, the instinctual thing might be, maybe we start with validation. So Lucy, no wonder you feel hurt. You know what? That alone is a really great start. And for a lot of kids, that goes a long ways. But for kids that are really struggling, we want to go even further. So remember how some of you gave examples where it was sort of a, a but. So no wonder you feel hurt, Lucy. But don't worry, you have other friends, not just Ella. Big X. We don't want to do that because that's kind of minimizing some of what Lucy is feeling and we're moving into fix it mode, which we love to do, but is not what's needed here. So replace the but with because. Let's look really hard. Why is Lucy so upset? What is underneath it? So here's some because statements that I'm going to make to see if I get to it with Lucy. Lucy, no wonder you feel hurt because you love Ella and you're so loyal to your friends. And I think it might feel especially painful because right now you're only allowed to be around a few friends. So you really, because of the pandemic, so you really depend on her. So it makes sense that you feel so upset because when she leaves you out or ditches you, you feel so alone, like you have no friends. Does everyone feel the difference? I mean, try and think about yourself when you're upset. If someone was to go to that length to really try and show you that they understand, what would that feel like? I can tell you for a lot of kids, it feels really, really good. So here's the thing. I imagine a lot of you have some butts coming up. But what about the fact that she was yelling at us and slammed her door? That's not okay. And you're right. So we're going to get to that later, but we can't correct a child's behavior if we're not connected to them. So there's an expression I love, correct before, connect before you correct. Connect with your child, help soothe their emotions. Once Lucy's emotions are regulated, then she can start to think straight. When we're dysregulated emotionally and in the midst of a meltdown, our cognitions are, even as adults, our cognitions are completely affected and we don't think very clearly. I mean, think of times maybe you as an adult have been really, really angry and you say things or do things and after you think, where did that come from? 
our kids still have so much development that's going on. Their brains are developing until they're in their mid twenties. So we have to have a lot of compassion for how hard it is. So when you do this, if after you say that, Lucy has a feeling of, oh my gosh, my mom or dad, my parent understands. They know I'm not a bad kid. They know this is really hard for me. That actually has an impact on, on her ability to regulate her emotions. You might not always get there right away. You have to be ready to do more validation until she's soothed. So some kids who are really angry might respond to that and say, no, I don't feel lonely. I'm just really mad at Ella. So validate that. You, you maybe don't always get it right, but they know you're trying. So then you could say, oh yeah, it's, I, you're so angry at Ella. You're really angry at her right now. Just mirror back what she's saying to you until you get more information and until she feels understood. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Now what I want you to do is, I mean, not Lucy's situation maybe doesn't resonate with everybody. Your child might have different struggles or in your family, you might be dealing with different issues. So I want you to think about a typical scenario in your house. Um, and that maybe you're dealing with within your family. So it could be that you have a child with anxiety, and often we know that a behavior that goes along with anxiety is avoidance. So your child gets really anxious, and you know they arrive at their soccer practice, but they refuse to get on the field, or the anxiety about going to school, or refusing to go to the dentist, right? The avoidance that actually kind of feeds into the anxiety. It could be about resistance to getting off screens. I know a lot of families and of course COVID really magnified um, the dependence on screens and technology for kids. And so a lot of parents are finding that there's real difficult behaviors, um, angry, um, aggressive behavior, or you know, in response to setting a limit around getting off screens. Peer rejection or conflict, which we kind of covered with Lucy, or expression of low self-esteem. So, you know, I'm also hearing you know, from a lot of families who have teenagers where, you know, teens are kind of conveying that they don't feel good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. And this is so painful for parents. How do you respond to that? Right? So I want you to think about it as something that resonates with you. And I want you to choose a way to start your sentence. And then at least two, ideally three, because statements. So if you have a pen and a paper, it often is very helpful for learning just to write these things down. But if you don't have a pen and paper handy, don't worry about it. Just try and think in your mind about a scenario with your child and maybe how you might try and help them see that you're understanding it. Really think about going to the emotion. So for example, with the resistance to getting off screens, I could say, you know, uh, look, buddy, you got to get the video games turned off because we have dinner. And then there's the big outburst. And so in response, I could validate and say, I know it's really hard for you to get off video games and you're really upset right now because you don't like my rules. That's validating, but probably not what's going to really help you de-escalate the situation because it's not really touching on the emotional experience of the child. So if you went a little further and you really thought about, okay, what's it like when I come in and I say, okay, it's dinner time, video games off, and I turn off the TV, what is that like? We have to, again, perspective taking. I don't like video games myself, so it's hard for me to understand. But if I try and put myself in the shoes of my 15-year-old who does like video games, then it might be something like this. Ryan... I know this is really hard for you because you're in the midst of a game and you're probably just about to get to the next level and then I'm coming in and telling you you have to stop. And that just feels so incredibly, it feels like, you know, awful because you're just about to get to that next level. And I know it's really hard for you because when you play video games, you feel really good. It's something you're really good at. So I know you love to play. It makes you feel good. And, you know, I wonder if you're also upset because when you play video games, you're really relaxed and there's so much stress to deal with right now. So it's such a good escape for you. 
yeah, it must be really hard to turn that off and to move away from that. Does everyone see the difference? So I'm trying to really take his perspective, right? Let's go back to our example of uh, John who didn't want to get out of bed. And I wonder if anybody would feel comfortable to help me come up with some because statements for John who's really anxious and can't get out of bed. So let's think about, and actually I think this is really helpful for anybody here who has kids or teens that have returned to school after six months of not being in school during the pandemic. Let's try and really put ourselves into their shoes. What is this like for them? What's it like to go to school and you've just got your one little cohort and maybe none of your friends are in your cohort and you don't get to hang out with your friends? What's it like to wear a mask all day? Or what's it like to not be able to go to the bathroom whenever you want to because your class only goes at certain scheduled times? I'm hearing from a lot of teens I work with that this can be really stressful. What's it like for a student that really already struggled with anxiety and school attendance and now has started to miss a day or two of school? What might be coming up for them? Does anybody have any ideas? So I'm gonna do a, a sentence starter could be, John, I understand why you don't wanna get out of bed because, any ideas from anyone that? Yeah, we have one from Amy, because you're unsure of who your teacher will be that day. I love it, yeah. That might be a real concern, especially for kids who are anxious. They want to know what it's going to look like and they want it to be predictable and safe. Excellent. That's really putting yourself into their shoes and thinking about how nerve wracking that might be. I have some more if you want me to read those ones as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Sherry said, because you feel safer at home. Yes, home is, I love that. And it's so true. Like being able to say, sweetie, home is your safe place. No wonder you don't want to get out of bed. It's so cozy and safe here. Excellent. Kate said, you're really scared because it is totally new situation. Yeah, again, touching on the pandemic and how everything's different. But for this, for this teen, it might be just different getting back into that routine if they already struggled. Yeah. And I have one more from Britt, sorry, that, who says, because you're sheltered from what's going on outside the house. Right. So, right, if, exactly. So, kind of validating, you know, you've been at home a lot and you haven't had that chance to be outside the home and get used to that. So, that must be really scary. Yeah, great. So, those are great examples because they're really touching on the emotional experience and they're really conveying compassion and empathy. So what we really want to get at with kids when we're validating is no judgment, no blame, ruthless compassion. Digging so deep because again, we're also allowed as parents to feel frustrated, to even feel angry or resentful because some of these behaviors can be so difficult. But at first, we are just working on compassion, empathy, and validating. So excellent, okay. Now we get to move into step two. So step one is validation. Now we're moving into step two. And for some of you, you will love step two because it goes to maybe what you naturally want to do. So step two is when, and we only move to step two when you see that your child has that feeling of my parent understands. So they are calm. They've been soothed by you. And you can tell that they feel um, like you get it. Does that make sense? That's what we're really going for. So now with step two, you can move into offering emotional support. So there's a lot of different things you can do to convey emotional support. You might want to just comfort and say, this is so hard. I can understand how difficult this is for you. You might want to um, convey understanding, right? So you might want to say, I understand that this is actually really hard work and you're being really brave right now convey confidence in your child. So um, being able to say, this is really hard, but I know you've done hard things before. Like you have been so brave 
And, you know, so that idea of, I know you can do it and I'm with you. Uh, reassurance. So it's okay in this case to reassure. So for example, with our Lucy, um, at this point, it would be okay to say you have a lot of friends and you are not alone, right? The sense of being a team. I love this one. For me, I think this is so important for kids to really hear their parents say, we're in this together and you are not alone, right? You are never alone. I'm always here with you. And also sometimes giving space can be really helpful. So sometimes, um, not every child, but some kids need a little bit of time to process. So just know that a way to offer emotional support could be to say, sweetie, I'm going to give you five minutes. Like thinking of John, right? You've been able to validate how hard it is to get out of bed. I'm going to give you five minutes and then I'm going to come back in um, and we're going to work on this together, right? So you're not letting it go. You're not kind of letting go of your goal, but you're just offering a little bit of space. And in the emotion coaching cheat sheet um, that's on that website in which uh, Nat put up the link to, there's a whole list of different types of emotional support that you can provide. So again, if we think back to some of our chosen um, examples, right? So if we think about um, Lucy, I mean, what would some of you maybe want to offer as emotional support? You know, if you think of Lucy and now you've been able to soothe her by saying, you know, you're such a loyal friend, you don't, you can't hang out with all your friends, no wonder it hurts to not have her to play with, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what can, and then you see she's finally soothed and calm. What could you do to offer emotional support? You know, it might be reaching out a hand and putting an arm around her. Some kids really respond to physical comfort and saying, I'm here with you now. I'm right beside you. We're going to get through this together. You're not alone, right? Um, I'd really encourage everybody to, you know, try and come up with like a, a little bit of a mantra with your each specific child, right? So every child responds well, but as you start trying these things out, you know, look for the one that your child really responds to. So I can tell you that, you know, years ago, I figured out with my daughter that saying to her, um, I'm right here with you and you know, I'm like, I'm right beside you. We're going to figure this out together and reaching out with some physical touch. So putting my hand on her hand and taking her hand, that was really soothing. So then the more I would come back to that, it became almost like a positive association and a signal to her, you know, okay, I've got someone with me. I'm not alone in this. And so it was a way to really help soothe her. Um, more quickly. So, you know, think about what works with your child and try different things out. Okay, so that's the emotional support. Now, this is the part that all the fixers out there, um, you know, wave your hand if you're one of the people that like loves to offer solutions. And again, going back to we're so wise, why don't our kids listen to us? We have so much good advice to give them. This is when you get to use it. So enjoy. Um, so often problem solving is really appropriate as part of step three, but there's a whole range of ways to offer practical support. So practical support is about then helping your child move past the emotional reaction and into either changing a behavior that, you know, does not fit within your family values. So for example, slamming doors and screaming, you might need to go circle back to that and in a compassionate, supportive way, you know, say to Lucy, okay, you know, I'm so glad that you're feeling better. Um, and, you know, again, the emotional support, I'm right here with you. We're going to figure this out together. But, you know, when you came in and you were so upset, is there a different way that you could have um, reached out for support from me, right? Because when you start yelling and slamming doors, that is really hard for everybody in the house, you know? I wonder if next time you were that upset, you know, you could tell me, I need some space, mom, and I will give you space, right? Or you can just say, bad day, talk later. Or, you know, you can go up and you can punch your pillows. You know, I'm just throwing out examples. But this is where you can do some exploring about how how you know your child can handle things a bit differently. So there's a little bit of an opportunity to do um, some problem solving, but also to learn from the experience. You know, sometimes there are these teachable moments. The key is you have to make sure that your child or your teen is soothed 
and calm before you do it and that they're open to it. So I feel that it's very important that we be respectful of people are not always in the mood, um, you know, to get advice or to start problem solving. And it goes a really long way with kids and teens if you check in and you kind of seek permission first. And again, I know that sounds a bit funny because as the parent and as the authority figure, it feels strange to ask permission, but it really goes a long way because it's really conveying that this is a collaborative approach. So it's not to say you're not gonna have that follow-up just because they don't want it, but it is maybe valuable if they're still not in a space to really process or to talk about how they could have handled it differently it really may be better to wait until a bit later. And so if you collaborate and you say, you know, I have an idea and I'd really like to share it with you. And they say, you know, dad, I'm just really not in the mood right now. I'm exhausted. Then it's really respectful to say, okay, we do have to debrief this, but I'm going to give you time to have a little rest and do something that makes you feel better. And how about after dinner, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. Okay. Just as an example, everybody's gonna handle it differently, but I do think it's really good to kind of get buy-in. So other ways to offer practical support. So again, building some skills, right? It can be an opportunity to introduce an idea to kids about how they could cope differently because a lot of kids who are struggling with their emotion regulation have some lagging skills. They maybe can't tolerate frustration you know, they maybe are very impulsive, so they fly off the handle quickly. So this is a chance to really help them think about how they can start to build up those skills. You might want to suggest, suggest a distraction or redirection. Like it's okay to, so for example, with Lucy to say, hey, you know that show we've been watching? Do you want to come and snuggle on the couch with me and watch an episode? I would love that. Would that make you feel good? That's great. That's a way to support, right? It might be to create exposure if that's necessary. So when I say exposure, it means being able to confront the situation that's difficult. So for example, with our teenager, John, who doesn't wanna get out of bed, it's often really important to help them move towards the thing that's making them anxious, but in a gradual attainable way. So maybe, you know, John is so exhausted, he can't imagine going to school but you might be able to convince him to get on a Google meet call with his teacher to check in with his teacher. Maybe you can convince him, you can arrange for him to have a visit to the school and just pop by and meet the teacher and get in the school building for half an hour. These are all steps towards confronting the anxiety. So this is an important part of emotion coaching is we are working on changing behaviors that are linked into the mental health struggles. And it may be time to set a limit or an expectation, right? So it might be with Lucy to say, you know, you're allowed to be upset, but you can't slam doors. So now if we pull this all together, let's go back to our Lucy example. And I'm just going to read out um, how it would look when we put all the steps together. So first of all, we're validating. So here we've got our validation, which we've gone through before, but no wonder you feel hurt because you really love Ella and you're so loyal to her. And it might be especially painful because you're only allowed to be around a few friends right now. And you know, I think you get upset because when she leaves you out, kind of makes you feel really, really lonely. Once she's soothed and she's calm, you might need to do a few more rounds of validation in response to her responses. Then once she's soothed, I'm here for you. I promise you're not alone. I'm going to help you with this. We're a team. That could be the emotional support statement. Then practical support. I was thinking of taking the dog for a walk. Do you want to come with me? Might be nice to get some fresh air together. Right? So that could be an example of sort of all the steps put together. So I know that's a lot of information and it's a lot to take in. If I could give you a few hints about how to start putting this into practice, it would be the following. So first of all, remember what I said earlier about choose a time where you're more likely to be calm and grounded yourself. And also don't choose the most difficult situation in your house. So go for something that's either easier for you to deal with or in the middle. So if, for example, you yourself are 
when we, when I think of John, I think, you know, sometimes parents who are dealing with kids that have that level of anxiety are feeling really overwhelmed. It's very anxiety provoking as a parent to be in that situation. So maybe don't start with the school issue. Maybe start with another kind of moment where you can see that your child is feeling sad or feeling a little less anxious than in that particular scenario. So don't start with the hardest thing and also try and really choose a moment where you've got some emotional reserves. Think about those typical scenarios that come up a lot with your, with your child or your teen now and actually write the script out in advance. There's something so powerful about getting it down on paper for yourself. It's gonna make it more possible for you to remember in the moment what to say. So, you know, use the cheat sheet and create a little script just like we did. So you can create something that looks like that. Have your step one, two, and three. Make sure you've got your three because statements and then practice it. So you could practice it with your partner, with a friend, um, talk about it with someone, or just, I don't know, stand in front of a mirror and practice saying it out loud. But rehearse it a little bit so you feel more ready in the moment. This will improve the chance of it going well. Another tip. You do not have to do this perfectly, and you don't have to do it every time that your child is dysregulated emotionally. Even a small shift in this direction can lead to significant changes for your ability to be there and connect with your child and for your child recovering from things that they're struggling with. And I have seen that happen. So, you know, I know there's probably a lot of um, different, you know, worries that you might have. So a lot of times parents will say, Joanne, if I talk to my kids like this, they are going to wonder what happened to me because they're going to think it sounds so fake coming from me. And I want you all to know that I have worked, I have taught so many parents this approach now and nine times out of 10, it helps in some way. And what I always encourage parents to do is if you have, you know, very savvy teens who are going to be on to you really fast, be very transparent. You know, say to them, look, whatever I've been doing, I don't think it's working all the time or working well enough to support you. So I'm trying something different. Or you can be really a little bit vulnerable and say, you are so important. I would try anything to make sure you get the support that you need. That's how important you are. And so what I would encourage you to do is if usually you have a style that's maybe a little more matter of fact or problem solving, or some of you may be sort of reflecting on this and thinking, man, you know, a lot of times I really minimize what my kid's feeling, even though I don't want to do that. So remember again, this is a therapeutic technique. It's not the usual parenting response. Even therapists like me with 20 years of experience, I struggle to do this with my own kids when my emotions are high. I have to remind myself all the time to try and come back to this. So I don't want you to beat yourself up if you haven't been doing this. It's a special therapeutic technique, but I do want you to be really brave and vulnerable and try it out. Even if you have to, you know, channel your inner um, theater, <laughs> um, you know, your desire to be an actor, I don't know, just do, do your very best and give it a shot. And then I want you to notice what happens. I want you to see what the results are and really take note of that. Another, a few final words. Remember, especially amid what's happening now, and I know, you know, a lot of you are on the Quebec side and today was a rough day for people in Quebec with new COVID restrictions being um, announced. I'm here in Ottawa. Ottawa is having a lot of problems too with our return to school and lots of cases in school. I think all of us are really feeling a lot of stress right now and we're worried about the impact on our kids. So remember that especially now, we can't fix everything for our kids. We cannot take away what's going on in the world and how hard it is for all of us. And in general, our job as parents anyways is not to fix everything. It's not to guarantee that there's going to be smooth sailing throughout life. But, you know, it's to guide them through the storm, storms and be their safe harbor. So resilience is actually developed by facing adversity and realizing you can get through it. And so now we're facing a lot of adversity and a lot of challenges. You don't have to fix it all, but you can be that safe place. You can validate your kids' feelings. 
then you can try and do some problem solving or come up with some practical supports. And you can be that safe place for them that creates a sense of security at home in their relationships with you, who are the most important people when things outside of home and out in the world are feeling kind of chaotic and not so safe. So this is why I think emotion coaching is more important than ever right now. And I'd love for people to take little notes for yourself as you try it out so that there might be an opportunity for you to report back when we do the question and answer. You know, I'd love to hear, you can send, um, you can send an email to uh, the connections folks. You can put it in the chat section um, of our next meeting if you have some success. And then I also want to hear about the challenges. So as you try it out, there's going to be um, maybe different challenges you come across. And so you can, again, send an email. That's okay, right, now. People can send emails in the, in the next two weeks. And then Nat can communicate it with me because she's going to give me a summary. And I'll try and cover as much as I can and answer as many questions as possible. Okay, I only went five minutes over. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanne, for such an interesting um, and informative um, talk tonight, and especially during these times where we're all um, we're all struggling with different uh, different situations. Um, I guess with you know for parents, um, I would say like be compassionate with yourself as well because. Um, if you're compassionate with yourself, it'll be a lot easier for you then to be compassionate with your kids. We can all use some of that. And um, again, thank you so much, Joanne, for this. It's been uh, me. wonderful again. I really enjoyed it, <laughs> even though my kids are grown up, but I, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, so just to remind people that our next session is on Tuesday, October the 13th um, at 7 o'clock. And if you could send us your questions, your comments, your experiences um, in advance. So if we could get that be, like by October 8th, and then we could get it to Joanne and she could put it together. And then we, we could come back and have, um, you know, a fairly, you know, focused um, session to address your questions and, and everything else. So, um, and just a reminder that you will be getting um, uh, an email for the uh, evaluation. And I look forward to seeing everybody back here in another two weeks. And just to make a note, I obviously put the wrong date on the slide. So my apologies. I have the 15th on there, but you've mentioned it's the 13th. So just so everybody notices that. Go with yeah. what Danielle says, not what I have written. <laughs> <laughs> so. Again, thank you, uh, Joanne, and thank you, everybody, for taking time out tonight. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We could actually, you can actually unmute if you want to say goodbye. You know, we don't have to <laughs> stay yeah, silent. Yeah, you're welcome to do that, for sure. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joanne. Have a great night. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks. Have a great evening. Thanks so much. <laughs>